Two weeks ago, we went to Psalm 96, and we started a thought about learning about worship from the Psalms. What can we learn about worshiping God through, through the Psalms? And we made the observation from Psalm 96 that God is worthy to be praised uh, because of who he is, because of his weight, the immense significance of God and his glory. When you see him for who he is and you recognize what God has done, you just can't help but worship God. And so he is worthy to be praised. And then we also notice it's not just that God is worthy to be praised. He wants our praise. He wants us to worship him. What I want to start with today as we continue learning about worship through the Psalms is that God, while he wants our praise, it's not just that God wants any praise. It's not God who says, whatever you've got, whatever you can bring, whatever you have, just bring it to me and I'm good. That's good with me. Maybe to say it this way, it's not just that we ought to worship the correct God, but we need to worship the correct God correctly. And that's really shown to us in the book of Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 28 where it says, Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And thus let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe. Now look at those words. I think they ought to catch our attention when we read that verse. Let's offer to God worship that's pleasing to him. Let's offer worship that God says is acceptable. I will accept, I will receive that. Well, what kind of worship is that? Two words. The words are very similar in meaning. First word is reverence. Reverence is a deep, rooted respect for who God is and the position he holds. And then the other word is awe, and that word is translated fear. Godly fear, to fear the Lord. We don't think about that a lot, about fearing God. But when you take the two words together and you form a working definition, the idea of offering a He is. Not a God of my invention, not a God that I like as him, but God for who he is. We're in Psalm 115 in our Bibles. Let's read it together. Psalm 115, beginning in verse 1. Not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to your name give glory because of your loving kindness, because of your truth. Why should the nation say, Where now is there a God? But our God is in the heavens. He does whatever he pleases. Their idols are silver and gold, the work of man's hands. They have mouths, they cannot speak. They have eyes, but they cannot see. They have ears, but they cannot hear. They have noses, but they cannot smell. They have hands, but they cannot feel. They have feet, but they cannot walk. They cannot make a sound with their throat. Those who make them will become like them. Everyone who trusts in them. O oh, Israel, trust in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. O oh, house of Aaron, trust in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. You who fear the Lord, trust in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. The Lord has been mindful of us. He will bless us. He will bless the house of Israel. He will bless the house of Aaron. He will bless those who fear the Lord. The small together with the great. May the Lord give you increase, you and your children. May you be blessed of the Lord, maker of heaven and earth. The heavens are the heavens of the Lord, but the earth he has given to the sons of men. The dead do not praise the Lord, nor do any who go down into silence. But as for us, we will bless the Lord from this time forth forever and ever. Praise the Lord. I love these psalms. They're triumphant. You hear those, and for us, we want to do the fist bumps and the chest bumps back then. You want to sound out with a resounding hallelujah, amen. Two, two words are used in verse 11 and in verse 13 when he says, those who fear the Lord. Twice he's calling for the people who are singing this hymn to fear the Lord. And the reason he says to fear the Lord and he praises those who fear the Lord is how he began this psalm. He talks about the struggle of the nations around them, but really the struggle of the nations around them is a challenge for every person, even God's people, even God's people today. The challenge is worshiping an image of God rather than worshiping God himself. There's a quote that's been written long ago that says, we tend by a secret law of the soul to move toward our mental image of God. 
What we think about God becomes God to us. In other words, there are some who, look at verse 1, reject God's truth, the truth about who he is and how he has revealed himself, and then rather than worshiping God in his truth, look at this, la- this passage, Romans 1, 25, they exchange the truth of God for what? For a lie. And what is the result? They worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. And so rather than worshiping God as he is, as he has revealed himself, I'm going to worship my impression, my thinking of God. Now, are there some, from Romans 125, are there some who have worshipped the creation rather than the creator? For centuries it was that way. We're going to worship the sun and the moon and the stars. We're going to worship animals. We're going to worship rivers. But I believe for many, especially today, it may not be I'm going to worship the creation, but I'm going to worship a God who fits my lifestyle. A God I like, a God I approve, a God that fits me. So in Kyoto, Japan, there's a temple called the Temple of a Thousand Buddhas. And inside this temple are a thousand Buddhas. You would go into this temple, and every statue is just a little bit different. And the idea is you would go in and find a Buddha that best looks like you, and that's the one you're going to worship. Because it's a lot easier to change God and to make him look and think and reason and feel a lot like me than it is for me to change my heart and my life and my will to become more like God. The old quote says it that while God has made man in his image, man has more than reciprocated. Do you know what it sounds like? It sounds a lot like this. <clears throat> I like to think of God as, he's filling the blank. You know, when I think about God, I like to think of God as just like me. He's just like me. He's into the things I'm into. He likes the things that I like. I like to think of God as, for some, I like to think of God as a close friend, As a really good friend. We sing that song, what a friend we have in Jesus. And my close friend, when I go over to his house, I'm kicking off my shoes. I'm hanging out on his couch. I don't call him sir. We call ourselves slang names. I raid his fridge. There's no rules. There's no expectations. We're just buddies. And that's why I like to think about God. He is my friend. And so there's no rules. There's no regulations. There's no religion. I just, I'm coming, there's a sense of casualness because God's not this ethereal being. He's my friend. He's my buddy. And so as I come and worship, it's a worship that reflects a sense, a grand sense. I'm just casual. I'm casual because we're just casual acquaintances. And so maybe outside the walls, there's some who worship and it's the rock bands and the light shows and the feelings-based experience because, because it's all just about how you feel. We're, we're buddies. I feel good when I'm around you. But for us, we can be singing the songs, but I think God's just happy I'm here. I'm here. We're hanging out. We're having a good time. I like to think of God as my friend. For some, I like to think of God as on my side. Whatever I am for, God is for Whatever I vote for, God would vote for. Whatever I stand for, God would stand for. My values are his values. My, my things that I praise are the things that he praises. It'd be baffling to believe, but for some they think in heaven there stands an American flag planted next to the throne of God because he's into everything that I am into. God is on my side. And then maybe for us today, I'm going to refer to it. We're not going to have time to get into it. But if you look at Jeremiah chapter 7, there's a time when the people of God were so entrenched with the temple, they would lean on it for safety because in the passage they would say, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. They're saying, we're safe because we have the temple. And God says, you don't know the God of the temple. And I think there's some of us today, and the God we worship, it's not this building, but it's the fact that we are worshiping inside a local church that has on the sign Church of Christ on it. And we're singing a cappella, and we got our suits on and our dresses on, and we worship a God of the church of Christ, a God of tradition, a God of the way we've done things before. Our worship has become our God. Where's this come from? I wonder that, like, where, how do you get here? 
How, how do you get to a place when you come before God in such a way that you would see him or you'd be so casual to just kind of meander into his presence? Does it come from someone who said, I, I, just, I studied the Bible deeply and strongly. I looked at it intensely because I wanted to know God. And the conclusion I came away with is that God wants me to come irreverently and casually into his presence whenever I want to and to bring whatever it is I want to bring. No, no. Because in verse 1, the response of those who see the truth is to worship him as truth. Listen to this quote. This is from years ago. This one writer says, For the modern evangelical worship is defined exclusively in terms of the individual's experience. Worship, then, is not about adoring God, but about being nourished with religious feelings. So much so that the worshiper has become the object of worship. The cause for this type of worship is the loss of devotion to the scriptures. Hear it again, Psalm 115 and verse 1. Not to us. Not to us. But to your name give glory because of your loving kindness, because of your truth. Can you see? What happens, brethren, when we elevate imagination over revelation. What happens when we elevate what I think about God over how God has revealed himself to us? Or from the language of this psalm, when all the road years ago, God wants his people instructed, look, by the living preaching of his word, not by idols that cannot ever talk. Not by the thoughts, impressions, words, and inventions of man. Do you know why this matters so much? And let's maybe make a clear distinction where we're going. This has nothing to do with, with corporate worship and the denominational world around us about bands and rocks and shows and women preachers and all the things that sometimes we tend to... It's nothing to do with that. Nothing. I believe there's something far more serious to this. For us, for our consideration today. Do you know why reverence and worship... This particular message matters so much. I want to take you back for a minute. You remember the, the priest, the priest, the first high priest, Aaron. His sons were going to bring worship fire into the tabernacle of the Lord. And it says, And Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, each took his censer and brought and put fire in it and laid incense on it and offered unauthorized fire before the Lord, which he had not commanded them. And fire came out from before the Lord and consumed them, and they died before the Lord. Then Moses said to Aaron, this is what the Lord has said. Notice, among those, those who are near me, I will be sanctified, and before all the people I will be glorified. And Aaron held his peace. What was the big deal with Nadab and Abihu? What's the big deal with worshiping God with reverence? Here it is. How I worship God is a direct reflection on how I see God. Think for a minute. How I worship God is a direct reflection of how I see God. That has nothing to do with instruments or bands or light shows. It has everything to do with how we are worshiping God today. How I worship him. How I sing. How I focus. How I lift my voices and direct my thoughts. How I worship the Lord. It's all directed by how it is I see him. Isaiah 42 and verse 8, the Lord says, I am the Lord, that is my name. I will not give my glory to anyone else, nor share my praise with carved idols. I'm not going to do it. I am the Lord. I am the Lord who made you. I am the Lord who rescued you, and I will not share my glory. And brethren, when we worship another God, maybe say it this way, when we worship God the way we want to worship God, that's the God of our invention, that's a God of our imagination. We are worshiping a false God. That's not God who he is. And if we're honest with one, one another, when we worship God the way we see him, in reality, we're just worshiping ourselves. We're honoring and praising ourselves. Do you know what Jesus said in John 4 when he was with that woman at Samaria and they were talking and she wanted to talk about worship, where we'll worship, 
the place of worship, and he says it's not about mountains, it's not about high places, it's about the heart. And he says the Lord is seeking those true worshipers who will worship him. And he says God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. And a lot of times we look at that and say spirit and truth. We have passion and we have the word of God. We're following the word of God. But go back to Psalm 115 and verse 1 and think about that phrase of truth and the idea of truth. Not to us, O Lord. Not to us. Not a God of my invention. Not a God of my pleasing. Not a God that I like and I align with. Not to us, but to your name give glory. Because of your loving kindness. Because of your truth. I want to worship you, you. I want to worship you as you are. Now, we can get that. I think if we, if we can see the stumbling block of how easy it is to worship a God of our own invention and our own imagination, to worship God the way we want to, not necessarily how he has revealed himself to us, if we can worship God as he is, there are two incredible results of worshiping God with reverence. First of which is that we are called to contemplate the glory of God. That is, in order to worship God the right way, the right God, we must see him the right way. We must see him as he is. So to take God as he is, we must see him as he is. You know, this psalm begins, and it calls us to look at those idols. He's calling the nations around them. But he says, I want you to look close at your idols, and I want you to, to, to examine. I want you to contemplate what it is that you are giving so much time and attention on. He says, they have eyes they can't see. They have ears they can't hear. They have mouths they cannot speak. They have hands they can't do anything with them. This is the one you've chosen to worship. There's an interesting question posed in Isaiah 46 and verse 1 where he says, Bell is bowed down, Nebo stoops over. Their images are consigned to the beast and the cattle. The things that you carry are burdensome, a load for the weary beast. It's not a fascinating thought. You have to carry your God around with you. He, your God, has become a burden to you, a weight to your life. I love years ago, I read about the guy who was talking about this image from Isaiah 46 in idolatry. Here's what he said. He said, the gods who are idols, they've got to be dusted like furniture every morning. Their faces are blackened by the temple smoke, the bats and the swallows and the birds and even the cats settle on them. Set them upright, they can't move. Tip them over, they can't raise themselves. If there's a fire in the temple, the priest can flee, but the god can only stay and be burned. The temple has to be locked up at night unless robbers come and steal their gods and their ornaments from one point of view, it's quite incredible that a man should regard as God that which he himself cut and carved and manufactured, that which he has to carry around like a piece of unwieldy baggage on a porter's back. It seems the most unnatural thing in the world to regard a thing like that as in any sense divine. Isn't it? I've got to dust my God because he's getting dusty. I've got to shoo the cat off of my God. Or, as Isaiah would go on to ask, look at verse 2. They stooped over, they bowed down together, they could not rescue the burden, but, but they have themselves gone into captivity. Listen to me, O house of Jacob, and all the remnant of the house of Israel. You have been born from me by, from birth, and have been carried from the womb. Even to your old age, I will be the same. And even in your graying years, I shall bear you. I have done it, and I shall carry you. And I shall bear you and I shall deliver you. Can you get the question that God is asking the people? What, what God do you want to worship? Do you want to worship a God that you have to carry around or do you want to worship a God who has carried you and delivered you? Do you want a God who's going to be a burden to your life or do you want a God who's going to carry your burdens? Do you want a God who you have to deliver or a God who will deliver you? It's kind of the point, isn't it? Back in Psalm 115, did you hear the cry from verse 9 to 11? Trust in the Lord. He is our shield. Trust in the Lord. He is your shield. Trust in the Lord. He will be our shield. Trust in the Lord, not in these idols. And verse 8, he says, those who worship them become like them. And then down at the end, sometimes we might think this is a strange language, but in verse 17, the dead don't praise the Lord, which is a way of saying what? In verse 8, you become like what you worship, and they're dead, lifeless idols. If you put your trust in them, you're going to become just like them. 
No one's going to rescue you. No one will deliver you, and you will have nothing to offer the Lord. But those who put their trust in the Lord as their shield with their liberated, uh, delivered voices, they will be the ones who get to sing. They will be the ones who get to sing the victory and shout the victory. To worship God as he is requires us, brethren, to see God as he is. That's, That's the point. To worship God as he is requires us to contemplate, to think deeply about God, who he is, his position he he sits in, but what he has done and what he continues to do here and, and through eternity. Do you remember every time God would reveal himself to someone in scripture? That God would give a glimpse of his glory to someone, how they would respond? There was never a time when God showed himself to someone and they said, hey, hey God, how you doing? Because every time God revealed himself, whether John in Revelation or Isaiah and Isaiah 6, as we sang just a moment ago from Breck's song, or even in the casual event of fishing on the sea when Peter put two and two together, every response of man to God's true glory fell in fear and humiliation because they saw who he was. Maybe that's part of it. Maybe part of the issue of reverence is that we have just misplaced who God really is in our minds with our imagination of God, our fantasy of God, rather than the reality, the revelation of God. So number one is, The result of worshiping God with reverence is I'm going to be seeing God as he is. But the other result of this is that I get to conform to his glory. Verse 8 of our psalm, those who worship them become like them. That is why this is so important to God. Hear it again. That's why worship is so important to God. Because you become like what you worship. Think about that. You become like what you worship. Worship in many ways is like a compass and it directs the steps that you take. It determines the destination you arrive at. And so if I worship approval, I want to be approved, I want people to like me, then my life will be plagued with envy, with self-esteem issues, My life will be plagued, hungry, thirsting for likes, for praise, for shares, for love, for people to to shower me with praise and affection. If my God is my appetite, my desires, then my life will be plagued with an unending... uh, (laughs) I was just talking to Benjamin about this. The words sometimes don't come when you get to 35 years old. With the inability to say no. Sex, alcohol, drugs, food, passions. It's my God and I can't say no. I just can't say no. If my God is power, I become like my God and so I become abusive and careless, self-centered and self-driven. You become like who you worship. Brethren, a question for you. I can't answer it for you, but you need to answer it for yourself. You become like who you worship. Do you want a barometer? you want a test for your life? Right here, I need you right here for a minute. Just for a minute. Do you want a real test as to who it is you really worship? Then look at your life after worship and who you are. What kind of conversations do you have in the car, especially after a day like today? When we worship collective, what kind of conversations do you have? Is it criticism and complaint? Tearing down other people? What kind of things, if you jump immediately on the social media, are you posting about? Worldly things? Contentious things? Things that don't matter? What kind of thoughts occupy your mind? What are you like after you worship? Because what you are like after worship indicates what it is that you were worshiping. You become like what you worship. So if you want a good test as to what it is you are really worshiping, who it is you're really worshiping, just take a good look as to who you are after a moment, after a day of praise. You see, Paul talked about the contemplation, the thought, the deep thinking of the glory of God. And he says, we all with unveiled face, beholding, contemplating as in a mirror the glory of the Lord. We are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as from the Lord the Spirit. Those who 
contemplate God, those who focus on God become more like him. It's one of the most amazing and fascinating thoughts that God doesn't just want to redeem us from our sin and darkness, but he wants, he's always desired to make us like him, to share, to partake in his divine nature. You ever wondered something? Have you ever noticed it? Have you thought long about it, what we do with our animals, especially our dogs? You ever noticed that? It's fascinating. It'll keep you up at night. We don't just give them dog, dog names. Rover, dog, puppy. We give them human names. That is David. That is Vivian. That is Brinkley. And then when we feed them, we don't just put their food on the ground. We put them in a nice bowl, in a nice place, with a nice mat so they don't spill. And then, sometimes, we take them out to like Starbucks. And there's doggy ice creams and there's doggy coffees that they can get on their own. When they go to sleep, they don't just sleep on the floor. We get them nice, big, plush dog beds. Or, for some of us, they're in your bed with you, in your bed. We buy them doggy clothes, forgetting that the good Lord gave them clothes from birth. <laughs> Sweaters and vests and ties. We... Uh, <laughs> When we were in Korea, when we went to Pusan, there was this beautiful nature walk trail. And so Holly and the boys and I would go about every day, <clears throat> and we go, we go walk the trail, and we would walk that trail. There's this one day when we had started on the trail, and there was these two older ladies pushing strollers, and inside the strollers were two puppies. It's a good thing I didn't know Korean, because if I did, I would want to say to them, Ladies, ma'ams, do you not know that God made them from birth to be able to walk? In fact, one of the things that God loves, or that dogs love most, is to go on a walk. You don't have to cart them around. They love to walk. Why in the world, brethren, do we do those things? Why do we do those with our dogs? I mean, maybe you've never thought about that. Why, why do we treat our animals that way? Have you ever wondered? There's really a, a rich and beautiful thought underneath it all if you chase it down. The reason we treat our dogs that way is because we want them to be with us. But in order to be with us, they have to become more like us, more presentable. And that's what God is doing with every one of us. Through the word of God and through worship, God is day by day making us more and more and more like him. Until the day when Jesus comes back and John says we will be just as he is and we will see him face to face. So can I leave you with that thought today? This is not just an average Sunday. What God is doing through worship is that he's making us more like Jesus. He's trying to. He's trying to make and mold us more into his son. And what we're going to do here today, as a family of believers, as Tom said, the family gathered together, in a real sense, from 1 John 3 and verse 2, is but a foretaste of what is to come. One of my favorite hymns from the hymn book we had back in Chattanooga is entitled, A Foretaste of Your Rest. And the first verse goes, Gracious Father, friend divine, consolation of the blessed, you have touched this day of mine with a foretaste of your rest. Though tomorrow care may come, trial arise and grief ensue, now I thank you for the time that I have spent in joy with you. Father, though I cannot see how my path will end below, still I know you wait for me where my heart has longed to go. When my body cannot stand, take my spirit to your breast, and with a Father's gentle hand, bear my soul to Sabbath rest. Brethren, that's what today is. Every song we sing, every prayer that we offer, this morning we're going to spend together. This is just pointing us, good brethren, to the beautiful foretaste, to the beautiful rest that is to come. God's trying to make us. He's trying to make me. He's trying to make you more like his son. Let him do that in you today through worship. Let's worship the true God, the correct God. But let's worship him correctly. You've listened so closely and so well. Thank you so very much. We're going to have a word of prayer and then one verse of a song, and we'll be off to our Bible classes. 
Let's be standing and let's have that prayer. Thank you for connecting with us this morning. We're so thankful that you were able to do that. If you have questions, we'd love to have the opportunity to talk to you. You can contact us at www.thebibleway.com or questions at thebibleway.com. Questions at thebibleway.com. We'd love to have you in person. Come if you can, but thank you for connecting with us.